welcome everybody um, to Sway Ventures. For those of you that uh, haven't been here before, this is uh, our headquarters office um, right here in Jackson Square. And uh, believe it or not, during the day, there's actually a bunch of desks right here and people working. Uh, but we set up our space to be conducive for events. So in a matter of about two and a half hours, um, we can convert it and throw a party for our friends like this. Um, and if you, it turns out you like our events tonight, if you go to the events page at sway swayvc.com, you'll see um, all the events. We typically do about two a month with different themes. Uh, tonight is what we call our pop-up events. We do them about once a month where we'll take a topic of interest that we think um, is compelling and prescient for the times of the day. Uh, tonight's topic is, I think, especially prescient given the context of what's going on around uh, the country right now and certain Twitter users. Um, this is really about inclusion uh, and diversity and you know, celebrating, I think, our differences um, uh, and coming together to build interesting businesses. I've been in the tech industry now. This is my 25th year. And uh, it's been great because I don't think there's a culture I haven't worked with, a gender I haven't worked with, and loved it all the way through. So if you, you'll see a couple of my partners that are going to be panelists tonight. They represent different ethnic minorities, uh, and uh, in, in either this generation or the last one are refugees uh, to this country, um, which is cool. If you look at these pictures on the on the wall, these portraits, you'll see all around. Some people ask us, is that your team? It's actually not our team. These are our founders. These are our portfolio CEOs. Um, and you can see there's wonderful diversity uh, across you know, gender, ethnicity, age, everything up here. So diversity and inclusion is something that we're, we celebrate. We're proud of it. And we're going to bring you guys a really interesting panel tonight. I'll introduce our uh, panelists in a moment. A little bit about Sway Ventures, if you don't know us, uh, we're a venture capital firm based here in uh, San Francisco. We have an office in London, so we do investments in uh, Europe, Middle East, and North Africa. We also have an office in La Jolla, uh, where we have a lot of our back office operations and also working on portfolio companies in the Southern California region. Um, and our team uh, is generally investing in companies at the seed stage uh, through Series B. Occasionally, we'll go much later and do something like Twilio, which you may know is a great local success story. They went public last summer. We're shareholders in Uber, which has had its own PR challenges <laughs> this year, <laughs> to say the least. Um, and those are a couple companies that, that we invest in later. But our sweet spot is really seed through uh, series A and B is what we focus on. Uh, predominantly a software focused firm, um, and we're doing about maybe two thirds of our investment in the enterprise software space and maybe one third in consumer. And within that, we have a pretty broad range of the types of businesses uh, that we'll back. But we're always looking for compelling founders with great stories um, and amazing ideas and world class teams. Um, and we're, we're honored to have a number of you here uh, tonight um, joining us. I'd like to call out our sponsor, Trinet. Uh, these guys are wonderful. They actually um, have helped us over the years uh, with some of our needs across our business, some of our portfolio companies. Uh, and I don't want to reduce their value to a PEO solution, but am amongst the things that you need to get set up for healthcare benefits, payroll, and a lot of the HR related services, uh, Trinet is one of the best in the industry. They've been a wonderful partner to us for years now, uh, underwriting our events. So we're, we're pleased to have you guys here. And if you uh, want to, uh, you want to just stand up really quickly. Hi, everybody. I'm Catherine. Uh, the three main things that we do is help you guys protect your valuation, help you lower your burn rate, and help you grow faster. So if you want to talk, I'm here. Those are three good things. <laughs> 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 Exactly. Uh, so our, our, our outside uh, guest panelist, uh, Trina, is going to come up here in a moment. She runs uh, a very important group within um, Intel's corporate venture capital arm. She'll, she'll talk more about her remit uh, when she gets up here, but she's been a wonderful friend to the firm, and I think you'll find her to be very bright, very knowledgeable, and very connected. And then, of course, we also have Sydney Thomas, who recently got a post at Precursor Ventures as an investment associate. 
um, and head of operations, and she's got a, a great background and a great story, and we're excited to include her um, tonight in the event. So um, I think the last thing is uh, we're going to do a panel. These generally, we're going to kick these off where my colleagues from Sway are going to introduce our panelists, introduce some topics, ask them some questions. <clears throat> but uh, pretty quickly, we like to transition to handing the mics to you guys. So as you uh, sit here and cogitate what's being discussed and you think of questions, just park those mentally and you're going to get a chance to ask our panelists effectively anything you want. We'll run that and then my colleague Greg is going gonna, is gonna to cap it uh, and we'll take it from there. So with that, how about a warm welcome for, uh, for our colleagues. Perfect. So first of all, I want to thank everyone tonight. Thank you, Trina. Thank you uh, for also just sharing your evening with us. We are joined by two phenomenal speakers, and we're so excited to have you. Um, I, think, I think first and foremost, as we get started, is just to give a quick introduction. Um, I'd also love for you to talk about what you're doing at Intel Capital, what you're doing with the Diversity Fund, and then obviously with Precursor Ventures. Great. Um, thanks for having us so much. It's great to be a good friend here at Sway Ventures. So at Intel Capital, um, and I've been there for 13 years, which is shocking in many respects, but I've continued to kind of change what I do. But today, um, as I mentioned, I'm covering um, and heading up kind of for data center, artificial intelligence, and autonomous driving, which are all very big growth businesses for Intel. Um, and trying to really kind of go from, where I'm a strategic advisor to them and then really thinking through how do we kind of build executable plans, um, deal roadmaps on, on that strategy. But then I had the um, great opportunity about a year ago to pick up on the, and take over the diversity fund um, when Lisa Lambert, who had started at Intel, um, had founded that in, two, in 2015 and kind of went to kind of a 2.0. And um, if I may just kind of give a couple please, of please. points on kind of what we've done there, which I think is a big point of tonight, as well as the diversity fund as it was initially conceived, um, the mandate was invest at least $125 million in companies founded or managed by um, women and underrepresented minorities over the next five years. And it was a very vertical focus group. We had about two to three investors that were specifically focusing on diversity investing. And when um, Christine and I, Christine Heron, uh, my, um, my partner on this, um, you know, took, kind of took it over about a year, about 15 months ago, we looked at it and said, okay, we're not having that direct staff because those people all went out into the business units. Why do we have three? Why don't we have 50? Right? You know, these are people who are going to be making investments in businesses in, that are aligned to our business units. It should first be, is it a deal that Intel will do? Is it strategic? Is it a financial opportunity? And is it diverse? And so we took that approach, it's like, and I want 50 investors, not three, chasing these deals. And so it's been remarkable what's happened. Um, to date, we've already have 83 million invested in the fund, of the fund, but we have, we, Intel, I kind of looked back and said, well, have we already been doing this? We already have 214 million invested in 42 companies. It is about 12% of our portfolio for Intel, which is, I think, typically the average is maybe 8%. Um, so, you know, we're kind of pushing that up, and depending on how you measure the numbers, this could be closer to 15, but we'll keep it low to kind of keep growing from it. But it's been remarkable in, like, we, we've got amazing robotics companies. We have tech, we have specialty chemical companies. We have, um, you know, AI companies. It's all across our business units, and I even have times where people say, oh, I hadn't even realized that my management team that I've been investing in is already diverse. Um, and and it's from small to large companies because we've got um, a, a portfolio company that has filed to go public and half their management team of 20 are women. So it's something where you can, you can do this. It, it actually doesn't have to be as hard as we try to make it be. Um, and companies can continue to evolve with it. But that's kind of a little pitch on, diverse, on the diversity fund. So Precursor Ventures is a pre-seed fund. We are 15 million in fund one, starting to fundraise for fund two, and we have invested in 84 companies so far. It's a lot of companies. Mm -hmm. Our average tech is about 100,000 to 250,000, and so we're looking at the companies that I like to say are pre-everything, but founder in an idea. And I joined Charles about a year and a half ago, 
where I get to do a lot of the fun stuff, which is working with our portfolio companies and making sure that they have everything they need whenever they need it, and also doing a lot of sourcing. So looking and figuring out where should we be that we're not looking. So we're looking across the country, and we also have some portfolio companies in Toronto as well. So I'm excited to talk about diversity. I'm a black woman, if you haven't noticed, and my boss is a black man. And so I think we have the unique vantage point of being able to see and influence our portfolio companies from the top. And it's been so much fun to uh, be a part of that. And so I'm excited to share a little bit about what that process has looked like for us. Thank you, thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, I'd love to kind of talk a little bit about Intel Capital. Um, I appreciate, you know, you giving us that, that well-rounded view, but it expands to more than just women and um, underrepresented minorities. Most recently you've added You've added military, you've added um, LBGT. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, what's driving that? And, you know, I'd love to kind of talk about the 2020 initiative that Intel has taken personally um, yep. in, in that. Great, so um, back to kind of when we kind of took it over, we said, okay, well, what are, what are the criteria? And it was women and underrepresented minorities. And it turned out that, well, let's understand what else we're doing with Intel's corporate global diversity and inclusive initiative, as well as with our supplier, because our supplier um, program also had a diversity initiative. And they had the other categories. We're like, well, why, why isn't this? And we just said, well, we're kind of rewriting the rules, and we want we, this should be representative of what um, our supplier base is doing, too, because this is, this is not just an Intel Capital. Intel Capital is an extension of the broader corporate initiative. So we look to extend that. Um, as a result, it has brought in um, a couple more people. Um, we do have um, at least one because we, it, it, again, it has to be very sensitive. I say within the U.S. Um, is where underrepresented minorities and LGBTQ um, can be recognized, but we want to make sure that they're, it's certified from a third party organization where they're making it clear that I am part of this community versus, um, because that can also be very dangerous in other countries as well. So kind of taking that approach to be more aligned. And then on the, the global, the corporate initiative, I mean, I, kudos to our, to our CEO who in CES a couple of years ago just said, we're gonna seek for representation in our workforce. And you know, we're, we've been able to get there so much faster. And I would say some simple things, kind of what we try to institute and where, um, and I don't wanna shortcut one of your questions that may be coming out um, in the future, but it's, really about being smart with your hiring practices, you know, and, and maybe having a broader hiring committee um, that you're kind of bringing in more perspectives. And, um, you know, and like we've kind of instituted this like Rooney rule, like, well, let's make sure you bring in at least two diverse candidates for the role. You know, doesn't mean you have to hire them, but bring them in to make sure you're widening your candidate pool. We and actually adopted the same rule for our investment process. Yeah. And it's, it's been phenomenal. It's yeah. it's something that we took on this year. So so I think that that's been like one one really big piece of kind of helping drive it. And um, but I think the challenge then is okay, great, you can recruit people and bring them in, but you have to retain them. And you know it's where, in, in some of it is kind of natural because you know we've been putting more um, um, women and underrepresented minorities and more kind of networking outward facing um, um, positions and next thing you know it's like they're getting swooped up because they're really really good so as a part of like okay well then how do you make sure you retain them um, I think is, is the next is the next challenge but I've been really I mean from an organization perspective I would say I've really seen for a hundred over a hundred thousand people organization it's really um, everyone's adapted it very very well I mean there's always challenges like when you try and push things like is this quota is like no it is not this is about smart business driving to better better innovation, better problem solving. Um, and, and we've seen that results in product design, in, in marketing, in new companies that are coming through, and just in even what I see on the engineering teams. So Trina, maybe picking up a little bit on what you said, which is Intel had the mantra of innovation through, through inclusion and diversity. How do you think smaller companies and startups ought to think about the diversity Maybe both of you can comment on, on how to build teams and, and how to manage teams. 
Well, I think the culture starts right at the beginning of the company. I mean, I'm, I'm really impressed to be in, like, and very proud to be part of an organization of 100,000 people who's actually been able to achieve broader representation. Um, but, I mean, if, as a startup, it's like if you think about it early, like your culture is set in the first 10 or 20 people, right? Um, may, maybe it's 50, whatever the case is, but if you, if you start off by being an, an inclusive company, um, that will become part of your company culture that, you know, it's going to attract and bring um, in, into your organization. Uh, so I think, again, it just starts early. Yeah, I would agree. I think it starts really early, and I think that it is in the little things, like making sure that when you have a company outing that it doesn't have to be a happy hour, that you actually ask the people in the company, what would you like to do, instead of that automatic assumption. And the cool thing has been that at Precursor, we're actually going through some of the same growing pains. So it's just Charles and I full time, but we have a cryptocurrency researcher and we have an EIR, so we've essentially doubled our staff. And it's been really interesting to see how we've managed those conversations and had those difficult conversations internally. Because I think you just need to, you just need to ask questions. And that needs to start from day one. I think that's a really important point. And you know, going back on the conversation that you and I just had around, you can have diversity, but without inclusion, that's when the problems really happen. And so could you talk about you know, some of the seed, you know, some of the very young companies that you're working with, how do they go about building that and forming that at a, such a young, uh, early stage in their company? Yeah, it is a constant conversation. And I think the, the main issue with diversity talks is like, oh, well, once we have 50% women and 50% men, we're done. We don't have to think about it ever again. No, <laughs> you're going to have to think about it all the time. It's a very difficult, conversation that needs to be ongoing instead of, like you were saying, instead of a being, instead of having it driven by quotas, it needs to be driven by people's comfort in the company. And so one of my favorite stats is that um, one of the leading predictors of success and just general um, like productivity in an office is if you feel psychologically safe and I think you fundamentally cannot feel psychologically safe if you don't feel like your company accepts you for who you are. And so I think oftentimes the people who don't get accepted are the people who are more marginalized. But I think marginalization can be a hundred different definitions depending on who you're talking to. I mean, the, the Bay Area is one of the most diverse in the country just because it is around technology, it's about engineers, it's about immigration, people coming from, from outside. Uh, but there are also problems. I mean, you see it uh, uh, when people hire same kind of people from the same ethnic background. Uh, it, it's probably more on first generation as opposed to second generation, uh, which were raised in, in, a, in a diverse environment. What, what, what are the, the problems that you see today that Intel, for instance, is, is working hard to, to solve on diversity? Well, you know, I think it comes into, you know, every conversation, every meeting that you have, you need to think about how can I be more inclusive? And um, I was talking earlier with a couple of people about, it's not just what people are saying, but you know, I mean, there's times that I just spend the time in the meeting looking around the room, looking for the nonverbal cues and the reactions and the shifts in the chair to know, okay, is there, like, how do I kind of have like this handshake with somebody in the room to bring them into the conversation or kind of bring, bring it up? Um, and that's something you can do if everybody looks the same or is all from the same background, right? Um, it's something where you can, because hiring people is a long process and hiring the right people can be. But again, these are just, really simple ways of just w working in any environment, any meetings that you may have about how to figure out how to be more inclusive to those other new ideas. Um, and, maybe, and, then, and then get to better results. And then I think sometimes also from a hiring perspective, uh, having more, you know, like the recognize that we all have biases. And I know in, Intel has been trying to do all this talk on, you know, and, and has been teaching all the senior leaders too of the fact that, look, you are biased. Like don't don't say that you're not because there's and there's things whether it's your experience and things you've been exposed to, you know, and, and and from your experience knowing I've seen this if this then then that very often so I might be biased to that point but recognize that you have those so how can I kind of 
be a devil's advocate in this situation, name it, right? Name that, okay, I'm taking a contrarian view here, right? Which doesn't necessarily, and I'll do it sometimes even if I don't have a contrarian view, but I haven't heard one come out yet, so I'm gonna try and take that position. And when you, when you do that and then even in hiring, especially if you start, because I think there are some different stats on, um, you know, where sometimes like people will be harder on, like women have to have already done it, done the job where men would, um, they can grow into it. You know, simple conversation, say, well, let's just flip it. Let's just change the, the gender pronoun. Do you think about that person differently? Um, and, just, and just have a conversation. And, and, but again, you have to create a safe environment where people are comfortable saying, okay, we're gonna be really transparent. Let's, we really want to debate this decision. Put, try as hard as you can to put your biases aside. I'm gonna call it when I see it. You call it on me when you see it, right? And that just it leads to healthier discussions and it becomes a safer you know, environment for people to really kind of think through, well, but this, so now what are the requirements? Who really is the best person to go drive this? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you made the point that men are promoted on potential while women are scrutinized even before they even have a chance to perform. Um, and I think that the same could be said of venture firms. And uh, you know, there, there are certainly venture firms that, are, that have a mandate towards diversity and inclusion that are investing in certain populations or people with perspective. How do we actually change that unconscious bias when it comes to investing and so that we can actually promote this culture of diversity and inclusion? Great question, because it's like <laughs> how to change so many people. I think it just starts with each of us have to do what we can personally do. Um, you know, I think that it's, yes, there's great reports. I think that part of the challenge is also from an investment return, you might not see those returns for seven plus years. And so how do we kind of keep up the, you know, can, we, we can have all these empirical evidence, but can we start showing truly all the different returns. And, and, and again, we have um, in, in the past, but it's also every, every company is, can be so situational um, to really track. But I think that you have to, instead of trying to make it such a broad initiative that we have to solve it in this big, massive way, think about it as kind of small wins. And whether it's a project team that's getting put together, or it's a new product that's gonna go to market. And, kind of, and I think if you can start seeing there, you're gonna, can, gonna, you're gonna start a good kind of snowball effect of, well, we're really seeing this value. Because um, I mean, one of the examples that, um, and you may have heard this before, but when we were, we had a team in our um, new devices group that was you know, developing you know, a women's bracelet, and the team was all men. Um, and, and then you know, someone was like, well, maybe we should get a woman in here. And because they were thinking about like develop, and she said, well, here's a problem, like all this jewelry, like I've got a, I get home, I just take everything off, and I stick it in a bowl. And it created the charging bowl, right? But, but again, like, no offense, men, but like, they wouldn't have thought of it, right? Um, and like, but again, like, with, within like 15 minutes of the conversation, she's like, okay, this is great, but if this is gonna have to be charged and connected, I would wanna be able to drop that into something, like, it's just easier, I take, it's, it's jewelry, I'll be thinking about it as jewelry, right. versus a device I have to connect to go plug in. If you had a wireless charging bowl, that would be perfect and there was a new product. But it, it, it's a sim simple example of like bringing some diversity into the room that created a new product. Absolutely. Yeah. I would say that, I think this is what Frida Kapoor Klein says, but your network is honestly, most likely, pretty homogenous. Mine is. Most of my friends are black women, because we're awesome. But <laughs> I'd say that, so the more people who are different, who you have in your company, the more people you will have in the pipeline who are different. Because those people are able to hire or recommend other people who look or have similar backgrounds to them. And you just create this ongoing cycle. And I think a lot of times it's not discussed enough that in order to be diverse, you first just need to get some diverse people in the room. <laughs> and once you have diverse people in the room, like 50% of your work is done because uh, obviously, like I said before, you need to ha keep having those constant conversations, but you will not be able to be introduced to the prospective people who could be making your firm 10, 20, 100 times better if you don't already have access to these types of people. So I think that is something that I'm huge, a huge proponent of. 
just like the hub and spoke of social networks, right? It's like just bring in a couple people to connect, now get your company access to all these other different networks. Exactly, yeah. exactly. I'd actually love to kind of get a little personal here and, and kind of talk about, and Najib, I'd, I'd love your opinion as well and kind of sharing your story um, about how, how your background has shaped the way you make decisions, the way you think about things, and also, you know, the, the people that you surround yourself with. Um, I'd, I'd, love, I'd love for both of you to, to share that. Well, maybe I can start. I mean, I, I came myself to this country about 30 years ago, essentially to, to study. And then I, I, I worked my way into, into the workforce and, and stayed in, in the country. But when I landed, I went to Michigan. Mm -hmm. And my thought about the US was <laughs> the pictures I see in the movies. Um, essentially Los Angeles kind of Hollywood uh, background. <laughs> when I landed in Michigan and I was studying engineering, I looked in the class and everybody was Chinese. I mean, I, I never really related much to China just because 30 years ago, I mean, China was a sleeping giant. Uh, but then I felt at ease because essentially I was in a melting pot and I could essentially hide or uh, survive through this, through this wave. And, and then later on, uh, a year later, when I moved into California, it was kind of the same feeling. I mean, California at the time, uh, there was a big uh, Latino uh, population that was growing. Uh, we did not have the kind of diversity that we have today. I think there was, uh, over the years, uh, a wave of Chinese immigrants in the tech industry and Indians, and, and uh, which, which makes it really a richer kind of experience. Uh, and the, the United States is essentially a land of immigrants over the last century. In the high-tech industry, it's even moving faster, and it is, it is faster. It's, it's coming not only from Europe, it's coming from, from Asia. But I think this kind of diversity is what created uh, the success in the technology industry, in the innovation. If you look at, uh, I mean, who is running some of the, the Fortune 100 companies, whether it's Google or Microsoft, and it's really people that uh, immigrated to, to this country. Uh, and uh, over the years, being they started from an engineering, uh, kind of uh, being in the workforce, and, and grew their way into management, and now they are running companies. And, and you see a lot of the uh, new startups uh, is becoming son of immigrants. Uh, so in a way, uh, I mean, innovation and, and diversity creates innovation and creates success at the end. Uh, whether it's color, whether it's gender, uh, whether it's ethnic, uh, I mean, I think this is, the word is flat at the end of the day, it's being melted together. Uh, basically, I'd love to just get a little personal and understand how your background has shaped the way you think about the world, your perspective, the decisions that you make. So, um, I guess always been black, and so I've always known that. I've always been the minority in the room, largely in rooms that are predominantly white and gender mixed, but predominantly white. And so I knew at a really young age that I was the odd woman out. I remember my one of my best friends in might have been fifth grade. She asked me, she's like, why are your knees a different color than the rest of your leg? And I was like, I didn't even know they were a different color, but she was white, and so her whole leg, I guess, was like one color white in mine, because, you know, your skin kind of bunches up around your knees, so it was a little darker. And so I had experiences like this for my entire life. And so I think I've always been a champion for diversity, largely because I've had no other choice to be frank. And Charles is actually my first boss who is black. And that also has been really interesting um, because I think I didn't realize how much of these things I was explaining all day. And it has been awesome to come to work the day after um, Donald Trump got elected where I literally actually didn't go to work because I was depressed. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and he got it. I told him, I was like, Charles, this is not happening today. I need, I just need a day. And he's like, I get it. That sucked. And so just having someone who just, you don't have to explain all the time has been 
has never been my life. So having that now, I'm not taking it for granted, I'm loving it. And I think that's something that I would push some of you in the room who are used to being in rooms that look like you and you'd never have to explain who you are or why your knees are one color, um, to just reflect on how much energy that could take out of someone's day for uh, who has to do that all day. In Sydney, there are certainly some sensitivities. I mean, when I look at in the U.S. versus outside the U.S., there are some sensitivities in, in, in this country about color, about uh, gender. In other places in the world, it might be religions or, or mixture of ethnic and immigration. Uh, when, when you look at kind of minorities, do you think this is more of a liability? Do you feel it as a liability or you feel it as an asset that could be taken advantage of? Depends on the day, <laughs> um, but I think I'm generally a very optimistic person and so I see it as an asset. I think uh, specifically being a, a black woman in venture, I wrote a Medium post about this a few months ago because there's abysmally few of us and so I just wanted to figure out who all of us were. So I put together a list, it's about 50 in an industry of literally like thousands of people and it's 50 across the entire United States. And at first I was a little bummed about it, but I actually saw that as an asset because when I go into the room, especially in the Bay, everybody knows who I am. There's literally no second guessing. It's like, you are Cindy Thomas at Precursor Adventures because there's no other woman, often in the room who even looks remotely like me. And so, I think it is an asset because then I'm able to be known and create this brand of myself that I hope is very powerful, but it's also an asset or liability because I'm, I'm fearful that what people see as my brand is then like all black women's brand. You always have that, that issue where you're just like, can I just be an N of one today <laughs> instead of an N of, all of my people. So I would say I love it on most days. We've talked a lot about culture and you know how important those first few years are and how it can shape the, the trajectory of the company. What about companies that are already at scale? You know, you think about a company like Uber who is who is trying at every level to kind of change the way. Is that is that possible? How do you go about changing something when you've and you've already established yourself. I'm hopeful. I think, I'm hopeful. I think it's hard. Um, wish they would have started earlier. Um, but I think it's really, really hard because so much of the culture of a company are the little things. Like, how do I write an email? Or, how do I have a meeting? What does the structure of this meeting look like? Or who can I interact with? Or how do we interact? And so I think it's a thousand little mini things that create culture. And so when that one person had put into place all of these thousand mini things, I think even taking that one person out, it requires, and for the culture to completely rejigger itself, requires a whole reset button. Um. When I say within Intel, like one of our company values is constructive confrontation and many times I don't see it um, as often. So, it, and again, like you have to call out these different micro inequities that you see where it's like, is this, is this what you were really, how you were intending to come across? Um, and, or, or be calling, like I'm sensing, whether it's like I'm sensing anger or frustration or different, you know, emotion can throw people into different views too. But again, if you can try to name what you think you're seeing and then them to say, oh no, that's not what I intended at all, or yeah, I am and here's why, you can open up the conversation. But, you know, it's, it's this, um, again, like you can, if you can really kind of say, okay, I'm naming it constructive, in the face of constructive confrontation, which is one of our core values, right? I'm now, I'm gonna challenge you on this and, and really kind of engage in a debate because it, it also kind of puts into a safe environment because this is what our company is supposed to be about. 
but I'm not hearing it, and we and we need to, we need to have a debate about it. And um, or again, if you call, if you see, I've also had times where people in meetings like to just repeat what the last person said in a slightly different way to maybe give themselves credit. Um, and when you when you see people do that, just to simply say, oh yeah, what he or she just said. Right, and you, you do it once, you don't have to do it again because it's, it's like, it's okay, you're all smart, you're all here on the project team to have a contributions, but we have limited time not to repeat what everybody just said or to, if you can really take it a whole nother notch higher, great, bring that in to the mix, but if, if you're just repeating, you're wasting everybody's time. And it, 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 it Deminimizes the person, right? Because often it might be again a woman said it, but now the guy now the guy said it. So people are like, oh, that was his idea. He's so smart. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was it was funny. Um, last night we actually Patrick and I are starting a new video series where we are uh, where Bill Malloy, who is our, one of our founding general partners, he's kind of getting really personal with with some of the founders that we've made investments in, as, as, as Brian alluded to. You know, we have a really diverse and interesting portfolio, but the one key thing that, that really stuck out to me in the conversation, and again, it happened organically, he, he got to the point about talking about hiring. And, um, you know, they're specifically looking for, you know, to bolster their engineering talent in, in this obscure technology called Scala. And the point that he made was they are really looking to have a diverse talent pool, and they have a new, um, a new director of talent who's who has this mandate of not only finding the best candidate, but they want to specifically hire for diversity and inclusion. And he basically said, you know, th this is a very obscure technology. If you think about it just by a pure numbers game, you probably have about 90% who are white, who are male, and you have about 10% of other people. And so how do I find that 10%? And it's a lot of no's to who potentially could be the right person, but I'm so dedicated to the fact that by finding that 10%, that this person is going to add a perspective that will be instrumental to the growth and trajectory of our company. So I'd be curious, Sydney, with you as a seed investor, how do you, how do you kind of establish that with, with some of the companies that you're making? Um, how do you kind of work with the teams to actually make sure that they understand that this is not just the right thing to do, but you know, there is, there is a business, um, there's a business value to this, there's also just a culture, you know, it, it definitely adds to that. So how do you go about instilling that in some of the companies that you're working with at such a young stage? Yeah, I think that the cool thing about being at Precursor is while we don't have a specific diversity mandate, it's one of those things where if you don't like diversity, you would go to one of the funds where there is none. <laughs> There's many to choose from. And if you do, you would come to us because we, reflect that in who we are. And so I actually haven't had to have those conversations with any of our portfolio companies because they get it. And so that has been amazing. I think some of the resources that I love to direct people to who don't, who are looking for increasing a more diverse pipeline specifically for engineering is Code 2040. I think they have done an amazing job in training and building a really talented group of young individuals who are ready to work. And I think one of their frustrations is that when they put their resumes kind of next door to another resume of a person who looks more traditionally like the person who should have that engineering degree, it comes down to the soft skills. It's like, well, they just weren't a great fit. And it's like, okay, explain that to me. What is a fit? And if you piece, I think, the more structure you put into place in your interviewing processes and your hiring processes, the more likely you're gonna make room for people who you might not have seen as a fit in the past. Trina, maybe a question for you here. I mean, Intel has been kind of the leader in, from the CEO down to have a certain goals, aggressive and bold goals on hiring and representation. Can you give us a sense of the progress of this effort and? In, in the work that you do as the chair the, of the diversity fund, how is this impacting the decision making? So from, from, from the corporate level, you know, we actually pulled in our, um, our metric of kind of what, our, our overall goal because we were moving it forward um, quick, quicker than we thought, but also felt that 
we should be pulling it in and like we shouldn't be giving ourselves that much time and really drive and 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 then I think the focus has really shifted a lot to even retention because it starts with you you could start with diversity okay that's maybe being um, invited to the party right where inclusion is now you're invited to dance and I think we were doing a good job of kind of coming bringing people in but now how do we think about the retention of it um, so the, that, that's come from a global perspective and I think what our um, global diversity and inclusion organization that we have at Intel is really taking on almost like an annual by annual approach of what are the metrics we want to drive to achieve this year. It was a bit of focus, right? Because we can't try, we can't boil the ocean. So in, like in, in fact, in this year, one of the key er areas of focus is, okay, we're digging deeper than women and we're focusing on African American women. That's, that's what we're doing this year. Uh, and but again, like because now can we drive and have specific metrics and see we, we can really seed here. From the diversity fund um, perspective, you know, we had this mandate, we've kind of looked across, well, we've already been doing this. And what I've seen, the number of investments, you know, this year, and, and I, when I, was, I was pulling up numbers and as I bring them up, um, our management committee is like, we need to be bragging about this because it's unbelievable what by taking it from three people to 50 has done. And I mean, we just put $20 million into a company um, that has, that's a large company that has a very brilliant, you know, woman um, co-founder um, and several other women on the management team. You know, so these are, it's not, it's not just at like the early stage seed investment, which we also want to support as well. So we kind of feel like we had, Three major objectives, and one is you know impacting the the tech eco tech startup ecosystem. There's the you know and, and, you know kind of horizontalizing this and really having um, extension of these 50 investors. That one gets a big check, right? Not to say we're not going to stop, but we don't need to put as much focus to it. And then the third is about really having a better um, community of different and community engagement model and resources because I feel like there's so many different groups that are all kind of working on level one and two of, and we're, we're, um, we're doing redundant work, but if we can find like really good sponsorships where we can combine and kind of bring each of our complementary you know, um, competencies to it. But on like the seeding the tech ecosystem, one of the other things that we did this year in Intel Capital had it is we had, a, we had an internship program where we brought in sophomores from college and we had 780 applicants, we hired five, and we said, you know, these are all brilliant applicants, all five are diverse, you know, um, black and Hispanic um, for the most part, and outstanding, and, and went, to, went to schools that we weren't otherwise traditionally. I mean, we had Howard, Morgan State, and Miami of Ohio. Like, again, you know, great schools, but just wasn't getting a lot of, um, from Intel. But the thought is, bring them in, train them in Intel Capital, then the next year, um, they can come back and if, they, if we want to put them into one of our portfolio companies, again, so now we're going to be seeding the tech ecosystem. And then after they graduate, they can decide, do I want to go to the startups? Let's see if we can find a job for them, one of our portfolio companies. You know, so we can kind of keep pushing it there. They've had a taste of both. They've had a taste of like a big company um, being, being going to get some training from Intel Capital. And then hopefully they come back to us after graduation or some point later, but again, how do we think about, we have the ability to bring in and give these opportunities you know, at an earlier stage, and, and again, like once that went to our management committee, I was like, I wanna emulate that. Like that's an amazing internship program. But so what, what Intel Capital is trying to do is really think about these new ways to be on the lead, just like pathfinding investments, we're trying to be pathfinding from a diversity perspective because we we um, we touch so many other like you know just smaller startup companies. We can see that early on. But maybe, I, I think that I think that we brought question, yeah. Uh, until until uh, maybe Sydney, if if people in the audience are interested in being involved and engaged in those diversity activities, are there any programs or organizations uh, people can can join or? Um, so Code Twenty Forty is huge. You can be a mentor, you can support them in many different ways, shapes, or functions. Black Girls Code is amazing, they're in Oakland. Girls Who Code is amazing, they're in San Francisco. Um, other ones that I really like, I'm sure there are so many. And I mean, honestly, I think some of the pieces of being a great ally is owning doing some of the work yourself. 
So Googling it, <laughs> <laughs> like showing an effort instead of, I think a lot of times we're asked to do the work and I appreciate being asked, but I also think there's space to just step up and do it without being asked. Um, and so I'd say those are the first three, but I'd encourage you to Google and explore other opportunities because there's so many out there. Yeah, and one at the risk of something that's very early stage that we're starting is we've been thinking about creating effectively like a Wikipedia for diversity ecosystem. And something that Intel wants to start, but we, we don't have the bandwidth or the ability to really own it, but it's like it wanted to be a crowdsourced way. We need to find some, we need it to where people can say, here are some great accelerators and incubators that really focus on um, diversity. Here's investors who embrace an index towards diversity. So again, if you, if, if you don't have the network, kind of where do you think you may want to go if you can't already kind of get there? Um, and then some of these other different resources that, um, and so we're, we're, we're at the early stages of this, um, and we've, we've found a couple of people who might sponsor with us and we're looking to kind of bring people to kind of help drive that forward where they can find resources and, and find better access even to events of kind of where things are coming up. But I think you know, having, having that then pinned that we can build out, but of course we have to make sure that um, we have some way to validate that the information in there is accurate, but it's something that we've been kind of thinking about from like the third leg of where do we need to focus. It's about like, so people don't have to continue replicating and doing redundant work, but you know, giving people who may not have the networks at least a place to go, there might be, a, might be more of a warm call because somebody is saying, I want to hear. You know, you mentioned network and it's, it's so funny that, you know, I've always heard power the network, power the networks and no doubt it's true, but um, I was actually, uh, I was invited to this private Facebook group. It's called the FEMPS and it means vampire, female umpire. And uh, actually Lisa, um, Lisa Fetterman from NAMIKU uh, introduced me. And it's this vibrant community of these really incredible women who, you know, it could be they're going through, they're going through transitions. Maybe they lost their job, they post the fact that they're, you know, they have this ability and this entire group of women are like, all right, I know somebody from the Food Network. You can join here, talk to her. They're, they're just making all of these connections in very meaningful ways. And you know, I, I think that you can't overemphasize the power of a network. And you know, it's just incredible to be able to have like-minded people who can support you and who are adding value to these networks. Uh, I mean, it's just incredible. I, I do think that we have a mic now. Um, so I do, I, I know that you have a, a question. Yes, please. Yeah, thank you. I, I want to thank you very much for for the privilege to be here, uh, to uh, hear the uh, the topic itself is wonderful, path to parity. I think uh, parity is, if you look at the global issues in terms of disruption into all kinds of things, technology-wise, social issues, uh, you know, you know, the all banking, uh, e-trade, uh, machine learning, I think we are getting into a phase where we need we the highest ethical standard is actually to respect uh, the path to parity, because parity is the one where you have the uh, bring the the highest level of uh, human species to a consciousness where we don't see ourselves like a snake because we have a uh, subconsciously we have a reptilian brain where we see everything as a danger, and I think once we overcome that. We probably will uh, will actually go beyond uh, our biases and we'll go to a standard. We'll have a global uh, innovation. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think when you say that the kind of that initial reaction of danger, instead of like approaching any time you meet somebody, what can I learn from them? Right? They maybe they've gone to some place that I've been wanting to go to, and I can learn about what what that trip might be, or there's something new kind of. In, you, you look to find that common ground, but still, it's like thinking of it as an opportunity versus a danger. Yeah. Uh, Trina, especially I was talking about uh, the diversity, what you've been talking about. Is that specific to the developed countries, or are you also trying to get it to the developing countries? Especially I'm from India, right? I don't see the diversity what we have been talking at Intel. Because literally, like 90% of them, or more than 90%, is men, and less than 10% is women, right? Uh, 
In developed countries, it's pretty easier to get it, but I think Intel is a kind of companies which needs to get that diversity, especially in the developing countries. So is there an effort with that side is something what I'd love from, to hear. From a corporate perspective, yep, um, yep. employment, yes, it is. But as you mentioned, it's quite difficult, right? And it's finding, but you have to kind of, again, be able to, from a cultural perspective, also encourage that more women are working, bringing those opportunities. But we've, um, I don't have the specific numbers of what's happening within our Indian or with our Indi India um, operations, but I know that it is an overall very strong focus. So, uh, any more questions? Yes, hi. Um, so, I'm going to push a little against uh, uh, homogeneity is typically about you know, being comfortable. You know, that's it's what people are searching for, and so typically the journey to a safe place, people could, is some discomfort. You know, it, it being being put in those situations, and what does that journey look like? I mean, in the one case, you've got big companies, and I kind of remember what that's like from the time when I, and it's, you know, but, but also with smaller companies, earlier stage, typically it's like, you know, we're burning cash, we got to go fast, we got to get best athlete available. It's, you know, a lot of rationale for why. And I, I'm, so I, I'd love your opinion collectively on discomfort, and, and you talked about a little bit constructive uh, disagreement, but I, I'm, I'm talking about maybe a different kind of discomfort that gets us, th thoughts on that, I'd really appreciate that. So it's interesting, our um, legal department just restructured and our general counsel, counsel sent a note uh, of saying why I did this and one of them was, I want you to, I want you to experience discomfort because you know, um, and, it, and it came from Andy Groves, you know, only the paranoid survive or as get it with, with too much comfort you become complacent uh, and then you can stop innovating, stop really taking some of those risks, um, you know, back to one of our other values like risk-taking culture, and I like, and like, like to call that too. I think that you, you need to be, you need to create that discomfort, um, but make, make sure that it's, but that it's acceptable discomfort, if that's kind of a fair way to think about it. Like, um, because you want people to be able to push the boundaries. Now, I think there are times, though, when if you're if you're in, because um, I've, I've thought about this quite a bit, like the way we form teams, and like what the Tiger teams might be, and even thinking about even the military, right? If you have a specific mission that you need to go off and go do, you know, and it's command and control, and you know what, it's not the time, it may not be the time for, hey, I've got another idea, why don't we go do this? It's like, we talk, but those ideas had to come up at the time that we were making the plan of what we're gonna go execute, right? So there's times you might need you know, a Delta Force team, and that's gonna require a different type of execution, and then it might be a, okay, we're forming a team for the purpose of creating a new product and innovation. I think that we have to really think about you know, what is the actual project that we're trying to do, and where there may be times where like, you, know, you need diversity and inclusion at one point, and then it's like, okay, look, we've already debated this, we made, a, we made a decision, now we have to go forward. Now granted, if there's enough new information that suggests a, a, a different approach, you need, needed to kind of take that. But I, th um, but, but I think we, we run the risk though, if you become too comfortable, like it just the, the complacency will, will destroy it. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that leadership comes into play hugely here. Um, I know my boss, one thing that I really appreciate about him is that he is so direct in his leadership, and so we have structured time. Then we make a decision and we move on. And if you didn't have your voice heard, you can talk to him about it in our in your 101 with him later <coughs> that week, and then make sure your voice was heard next time. And so I think so much of that is necessary in creating a really cohesive group. I also think, though, that um, I, actually, I really do want to circle back to your original point around the um, being confrontational in a productive way. I've done that <laughs> a lot of times in my office, and it's been, I think when it's received with grace and kindness and empathy, it is one of the best feelings in the world. And so the point that I was making earlier about the happy hour discussion, that was just happened last week in our office where one of the guys in our office was like, we need to have more group happy hours. And I was like, 
I don't want to drink with you. <laughs> and instead I said, how about let's do group lunches? And it was received with so much empathy. He's like, cool, let's do it. Um, but I think that those conversations need to happen or else you just submerge. And to your point, you submerge when you're in these times of intense stress, which means when it, those times become more calmer, people can be, I think, a little more extreme about their views because they didn't have the time to um, express them when the times were a little more stressful. So I think always being really honest and forthcoming with how you're feeling is the best the best step. Hi, my name is uh, Patrice. Um, let's just introduce myself. I'm a feminist and uh, my mother was an, an entrepreneur. So um, yesterday I was watching a webinar from a Stanford University Innovation and Entrepreneurship Program. And it was interesting because actually there was a, a chart which was sh uh, showing how um, um, it is tough to build and to uh, succeed within a diversified team. It's not really um, an easy game. But then on the same chart, it was showing that um, the company which has been the most uh, disruptive was also a very div uh, diversified team. So my question is just for you as an expert in the VC area. Um, how do you bring this number where we are so, uh, um, uh, in general, uh, the, the most uh, diversified team are not succeeding to really to reach to the level where they become really disruptive? What are, yeah, what are you, your? Yeah, I, th I think it's really just um, empowering the leaders and really, really kind of encouraging just the overall strong leadership of like, okay, you've got, now that you've got this diverse team, now how do you actually lead and, and drive it? Because it's not, it's not just assembling the team, it's now you have to execute um, in, in um, synchronization or harmony, whatever you want to call it, right? But I think it's then just not neglecting kind of the, the natural leadership skills that would need to, uh, to continue, even from, even from a board perspective. Um, and, and, like, and like even like how you would choose like who is on your board and how the different advice that they may give you or if you're a board member, you know, when you see some of these things really helping kind of um, where, I mean, I, I recently saw one of, one of my companies was looking to, um, you know, do some raises and stock grants and I noticed that and they were saying, oh, we're pegging everybody's salaries in kind of this kind of 25 to 50% quartile range and I look at the two women and I said, can you just explain why it, they're not in the same same place? Um, and, it, and it's work because and there was actually really good context and kind of like some, someone was just there, someone's actually getting lots and lots of option grants continuously, so they needed to up it. Um, but it was a bit of like if you just on the abstract, if any random person saw this page, they might wonder if there was gender discrimination. I don't know if there is, but I'm like, I accept that answer. That's great. But again, you just have to think about whenever you see these things where and, and they're like, thanks for pointing it out, like hadn't realized how that could otherwise have looked. Um, where I, I think it, you, you have to make sure that you can retain the people, but you have to bring in the right leadership and continue to drive. Because the reality is like 0.1% of the startups actually make it, right? So um, it's hard, it's, it's like you can do all these different things and there may be other reasons why. Um, it's not just be for, for a diverse team. Um, I heard a really good point. Um, last night about, you know, you have to be correct in your marketplace, um, kind of in your market choice and kind of the market dynamics. You need to be differentiated enough, uh, which again, diversity can really help from a differentiation point. And you have to execute. You have to do all three. Um, and, in, and, and if you just focus on differentiation from diversity, that's not gonna do it, right? You still have to have the right market, the right opportunity, and you have to execute. Um, so I think that's what I'm talking about, like from the leadership coming in is incredibly important. I think that's what it kind of takes to the next level. I would say just plus one. And also I think that the unfortunate part is that a lot of what it takes to succeed in being a startup is survival. 
And I think when it comes to having a diverse team, and that means that you're going to go through many more iterations until you produce a final product, that your probability for survival is, I don't want to say lower, but it's just going to, it's harder. And so I think what it requires is a lot of people who are VCs who understand that and say, okay, I know it's going to take you an extra month or two or three to actually find the sweet spot. But when you do, it's going to be amazing and I can't wait. And so just this process of coaching with understanding that what you're asking them to do is sometimes literally impossible with the time constraints that you're asking them to do it. And so leading with that understanding is huge. And actually one thing that we are seeing in, in the new startups, especially with young people graduating, they are much more diverse than, than in the past. And, and when you look at the, the college, uh, the, uh, my, my son is going through a college application process and the types of questions they ask is really to design the class to be very diverse. I mean, I, I think there is a lot of thought that is going into putting some of those questions. It's about whether it's ethnics or, or interest or activities that were done by, by the high school uh, students. And, and based on all of that, they, they tr most colleges, all of them, are trying to focus their marketing, their selection process on building a diverse class so that it becomes richer for the college itself and that will prepare for the next generation of professionals. And the startups that we are seeing, entrepreneurs that are coming, are very diverse and uh, fairly kind of mixed in terms of different backgrounds. So, so I think as we close tonight, um, you know, I, I kind of want to challenge the group. Um, you know, I know we have, we have VCs in this room, we have startups in this room, and I think the important thing to think about is that every single person in this community has a vote, and there are different ways that you vote. Um, for VCs, we vote by the way we invest and who we invest into. I think for startups, it's the way you hire, it's the culture you assemble, and it's also who you accept money from. Um, that's a really important point. And you know, I think, I think the challenge here is to, to be contrarian, as you said. And it's also go to the VCs who are investing in women, who are hiring women, who are hiring minorities or underrepresented minorities. And I think that there's a way to break this cycle, and it starts with the vote, and it starts with the choice. And you know, I think that collectively, if we can be a little more conscientious about the decisions that we make and the people that we surround ourselves, you know, this is certainly something that we can tackle. And so I, again, want to thank Sydney. I want to thank you, Trina. This has been a fantastic panel. Um, I certainly appreciate everyone's questions from the audience. And uh, I think that we will, uh, we will close. Thank you. Thank you. So if you, if you stay in your seats just a second, again, thank you, um, Trina, Sydney, um, outstanding. And also for Lonnie Nguyen, uh, a founding partner here at Sway Ventures for just a terrific leading of the panel and Najib, a general partner here at Sway Ventures. Um, so I, I'm, a, I'm a partner here at Sway Ventures as well. I'm responsible for revenue and market development. It's kind of a charmed life, um, actually. And, and I think I'm gonna try to get to uh, a, another key sponsor. It's a charmed life and I'll tell you why in a second. So Trinet again, if you wouldn't mind, uh, applause for Catherine and the team there. Thank you so much. My charmed life is a little bit like Sydney's. I get to work with our portfolio firms across a few things. And um, am I going the right way? Thanks. Yeah, please help me out. You've done so great tonight. I get to help on a couple of things. And, and we think in terms of what is in your hands all the time. And it's generally capital, and it's revenue, and it's talent. And it probably is in that order if you're a startup. And on the capital side, we're good at that. We're a VC, we can syndicate, we work with great partners like Intel Capital and, and great LPs and strategic uh, tier one venture partners. Um, but we, on, on, the, on the revenue side, it's, it's about giving introductions and, and helping the portfolio grow. It's all about growth. But then there's this other item, item called talent. And we spend a lot of time on talent. Um, across our, 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 our core investments, we've placed in, in, at least uh, across 80% of them key talent. With that said, what we wanted to say tonight and what we wanted to say about these particular firms is not only are they very diverse and, and represented by the theme tonight, um, terrific opportunities across this group. Those of you that have stickers on your badges, we know who you are. If you have an orange sticker, you're coveted because you're looking for work and we want you to come work with one of the companies. 
Um, you might be a startup also looking for funding. You might also be looking to hire, or you might be an investor. So um, I would ask that you connect tonight, if you can, spend a little more time together. Come see me, because I'm critical path in many cases on, on who we might put in front of portfolio firms, as well as my, my, um, our other partners and general partners. So with that, I'd like to just close and thank our panelists again, and, uh, and thank you all for coming tonight.